Hello, and welcome to my presentation for Ishtar Fest. My name is Steph von Scott, and I'm the presiding officer of the Scottish Pagan Federation. I am a prominent pagan rights activist in my home country, and for my faith, I am a Sumerian Reconstructionist pagan. I sit on the board of the Pagan Heathen Symposium representing Sumerian paganism, and I am the founder of the Temple of Anana organisation and the founder of the Council of Near Eastern Pagan Religions, and I am the director of IANA Press. I am also the author of a highly controversial book, From Ishtar to Eostra, reframing the Near Eastern origins of an Anglo-Saxon goddess. And I would like to say before I get into this talk, that it is not really the aim of this book to prove that the Anglo-Saxon goddess Eostra was the goddess Ishtar because academia just doesn't work this way. No one in academia deals in absolutes and nothing is completely debunked. Not when new evidence is being unearthed each passing decade, which allows us to glean new understandings and helps us reevaluate our evidence and posit new theories. The main aim of my book is to instead provide a working model to show that there's perhaps more to this picture than many people are letting on. Now, my academic background is in archaeology. I study archaeology between the University of Edinburgh and the University of Glasgow, with the focus on the ancient Near East and Mesopotamia, although I also study um, ritual practices and magic. I, I study the literature of the ancient Near East, art of the ancient Near East, as well as aspects of Near Eastern demonology and some of the cults of Near Eastern deities, such as Anat and Mithras. I also study magic in ancient Greece and Rome and the origin of the Mediterranean civilizations. Now today I am here to present a lecture entitled In Search of Eostra, although it's really called Easter is all about Ishtar, and that's going to be a lot of fun. So, in the beginning. On the 27th of March 2013, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science posted a meme to their Facebook group stating that the Anglo-Saxon goddess Eostra was originally the goddess Ishtar. This did not go down well. The first debunking article followed just three days later on the prominent heathen blog, The Northern Grove. This article stated that it was a cultural appropriation to even suggest that Ishtar was related to the Anglo-Saxon Eostra. The article then went on, as many of you are no doubt aware, to say that modern heathens were being treated just the same as Native Americans by this comparison. They then spoke of white people suffering the very same prejudice as indigenous people, namely Native Americans, by saying that Ishtar or Astarte might be related to Eostra, and it called others to action. This article concluded that heathens are the victims of oppression and assimilation and persecution, just in the same way that Native Americans were being persecuted and are being persecuted today, just for suggesting that Ishtar might have came from Eostra or Oostra is related to Ishtar. This article caused quite a backlash, though surprisingly not for its folkish or racist rhetoric. Instead, it caused fury among the heathen communities worldwide, who all took up the cause with a score to settle. How dare someone say their white-skinned Anglo-Saxon Eostra came from a dark-skinned Semitic Middle Eastern goddess like Ishtar? I mean, how dare they? This anger spread wider towards the neo-pagan communities who were furious that their poor persecuted Germanic pagan brethren were being persecuted in such a way. A series of debunking articles followed on from this, all of which were built on arguments presented in the first. And now, almost 10 years on, and to even suggest that Ishtar could possibly be related to Eostra, is met with extreme fury, hatred and ridicule. 
But what are my issues with the debunking articles? Well, they are all accepted unquestionably as 100% undisputable fact. There are no references or academic citations in any of them. Most are based on opinions and feelings rather than academic evidence or research. Statements such as Ishtar sounds nothing like Easter are disingenuous as they take the modern pronunciation of an ancient word as unchanging over time. A better question should have been, for example, what did the word Eostra sound like during Bede's time? Now, the first and most prominent argument presented in the debunking articles as to why Ishtar cannot possibly be related to Eostra is, Ishtar is a goddess completely removed from the linguistic and geographic region where Eostra reigned. Ishtar is related to Astarte and Inanna, which are all found in the Middle East area. Now, this argument comes from the Northern Grove, and it was one of the very, very first articles to try and debunk the links between Ishtar and Eostra. The problem with this argument is it is a lie. Are all of Astarte and Ishtar's temples found in the Middle East? No. They are found, yes, in the Middle East, but also in the Levant and Egypt, across to Cyprus, across to Malta, up to Sicily, up towards Rome, in Carthage in North Africa, then to Sardinia, then to Ibiza, Valencia, eh, Granada, Seville and Cadiz, and then up towards Great Britain, where there are seven altars dedicated to the Near Eastern goddess there. Hang on a second. How can a foreign goddess travel from the Middle East to Britain? And what was she doing out of the kitchen? I find it very worrying that while it is widely accepted that male gods from the Near East all travel to Britain, we treat a female deity like Ishtar or Astarte as though she should be consigned to the kitchen like a good little housewife, rather than being on par with the male gods. Now, in the ancient world, Ishtar was pretty much a political powerhouse of a goddess, and the most popular goddess during all time periods. Ishtar was a goddess who granted kingship, a rule that elevated her on high, even above most of the male gods of the region. In Mesopotamia alone, she had 190 temples dedicated to her, while the Mesopotamian mother goddess Ninhursag only had 21. Even the highest god of the pantheon, Enlil, had a fraction of the temples Ishtar did. She was a goddess elevated above all others and for most of her worship. Yet while we accept it unquestionably that we have other altars to other Near Eastern male gods in Britain, such as Mithras or Baal, when someone even suggests a female deity like Ishtar could travel from the ancient Near East to Britain, people lose their minds. They forget that she was venerated in the exact same region as Jesus was, and she travelled to Britain using the same uh, pathways and same journeys. And to be honest, I find the entire thing a little sexist. Now, before we go any further, let's have a little look on Ishtar and Astarte. How can the same goddess have two different names? Now, I know this is an issue with pagan reconstructionists who take different spellings of the same goddess as complete isolate deities. For instance, pagan reconstructionists might argue that Ishtar uh, worshipped in Sumer is a different Ishtar who was worshipped in the Levant, who is a different Ishtar who was worshipped in Nineveh, who is a different Ishtar who was worshipped in, for instance, um, Egypt or across to Cyprus. Uh, and some will even argue that Ishtar worshipped in a different city uh, in Mesopotamia is a different Ishtar to the one worshipped in the city next door. Uh, and a lot of that is just nonsense. Now, we take the Near Eastern God Jesus as an example. We know in Greek the translation of his name is Eusus, while in classic Hebrew it is written as Yeshua, while in late Hebrew it is written as Yeshu. What the, and then we take in Greek we will find the spelling is Eosus, which through the Latin Isis, uh, uh, which is where we get the English spelling today of Jesus. The relationship of Eosus 
to Yeshua, to Yeshua, to Jesus, to Jesus, is never questioned, nor are there any attempts to say they are all different deities. Yet these concepts are accepted unquestionably when it comes to New Eastern God Jesus, a God who originally came from uh, to the Western world from the Near East and from the very same location where Ishtar and Astarte was once venerated. Yet when it comes to Ishtar and Astarte, people still treat them as two separate deities, even though the spellings of the names, for the most part, are exactly the same. We find that Astarte recorded in the written form of Ishtar or Anana is translated to Astarte or Ashtart, depending on where the text was found by the academics in question. And you will be able to see from the actual chart at the side where um, Ishtar or Astarte is translated to different um, names depending on where the text is found. Ishtar Me is translated to Astart of Battle, while Ishtar Guparamte is translated as a start of um, Zruptu, whereas um, Enana Basi is translated to a start of Hal, um, whereas Enana Kibri is translated to a start of the riverbank. Um, again, all of these spellings and pronunciations either start with Ishtar or Enana, and they're translated to a starte or a start because they were found in Imar. And it's the same when texts are found in Ugarit, when texts are found in, in other places that aren't a Mesopotamia, we would take translations in cuneiform of Anana, even if they're written in, for instance, um, Akkadian cuneiform, um, but they're found in um, Ugaritic settlements as a start or a starte which I think causes widespread confusion. So who was the goddess Ishtar or Astarte? Now, the goddess had actually Proto-Indo-European origins, uh, which many people do not realise. She first appears in the written word as a goddess with a cognitive linguistic root, TTR, um, the Semitic Ishtar or Ishtar, and the Western Semitic Astarte or Astaret. Her origins are in the Proto-Indo-European star goddess Hastur, meaning star or Venus. And from the early Indo-European Hastur, she is believed to have developed into the Proto-Semitic Atar, meaning star or Venus, and then to the Proto-Semitic Atar, meaning star or Venus, and from there she branched off into the Western Semitic Atar, still meaning star or Venus, and the Eastern Semitic um, Atar, meaning um, um, a star or Venus, and it's, at this point she is first attested as a goddess in both both the Akkadian Ishtar uh, and uh, Ishtar and the Elabite Ishtar and Astar. Uh, up until that point, it is believed she was worshipped as the star or Venus. It is only during later periods that they believe they they assigned uh, a female form, uh, and and the mythology developed over time. Now, Proto-Indo-European languages have their root in the same area of Syria and Anatolia, where Ishtar first originated, and the earliest form of Sanskrit uh, that is used in the Rig Veda, um, called Old Indic or uh, Rig Vedic Sanskrit, was first recorded in inscriptions found in northern Syria too, and they are linked to the Mitanni people, and they were recorded by Mitanni royalty. So the timeline of Ishtar and Astarte in Mesopotamia starts around 5300 BC um, with the first temple to the Mistress of Beasts Appealers uh, in, in Turkey, in Katalhuyuk, which is a precursor to Ishtar. Uh, and again, this temple is in the same area where a lot of people believe that Ishtar originally uh, originated um, through the Proto-Indo-European Atar or uh, Hastur. By 4200 BCE, her first temple um, is erected in the city of Uruk, and then by 2600 BCE, we get the first attestations in the written Semitic form, which appear in the city of Shurapak. By 2300 BCE, Ishtar is merged with his, uh, the Sumerian goddess Inanna in southern Mesopotamia under the Sargonian dynasty. 
And then by 1900 BC, she becomes elevated even further in her position to national goddess of all of Mesopotamia. And there she stays until the rest of the empire's history. It continued on even into modern times, despite the rise of Christendom and the spread of Islam. Um, despite these new religious movements, Inanna was still worshipped as late as the 10th century in the common era by the Sabines, who sang laments to Ishtar and Tammuz. And we have attestations of her cult still in existence in Mardin, which is in southeastern Turkey, as late as the 18th century, which is really only a few hundred years ago. Now, her worship finally died out, eh, only with the Assyrian massacres and genocides that were carried out by the Ottoman state, and they took place in 1895 and 1896. And at that point, eh, out of a million Syrians, Assyrians worldwide, this left eh, 850,000 dead and 250,000 displaced, and there are no records of her, of her cult after this time period. Now, the fact that the endurance of Ishtar Astarte as a goddess spans almost six millennium should not be taken lightly. This was a goddess elevated above all others, enduring most, if not all, of her worship, and she went on to influence a great many other deities across time and across history. Now, at around um, 1427 to 1400 BCE, Ishtar was adopted into Egypt during the New Kingdom era. Now, this took place under the reigns of either Tutmos III or uh, Amenhotep. Um, we're not quite sure. It was during this time period we know that the Semitic-speaking Assyrian horse trainers brought Ishtar's worship to Egypt, where she was adopted into the Egyptian pantheon. And there she stayed uh, dur during the uh, polemic to the Roman periods, um, 332 to 395 uh, common era. It may seem odd that Egypt would choose to adopt a foreign goddess into their pantheon, but this seems to have been part of a larger political and cultural change during this era. We see three other Semitic deities alongside Ishtar being adopted into the Egyptian pantheon during this time period, namely Baal, Reshep and Hauron, and the goddess Nat would follow later during the reigns of, of Ramses II. I mean, uh, academics agree that Ishtar was probably brought into the pantheon due to her connection to the chariot, for no Egyptian goddesses uh, was the patron of such a role at the time, given how the chariot was a relatively new piece of military technology, and it was tied to horses and to battle, which is why Ishtar and Astarte were the, the popular choice. Now, by 1200 BC, Ishtar's worship had moved to Cyprus during the late Mycenaean period. Cyprus acted as an intermediate point in sea travel for the Phoenicians, a seafaring Semitic people who elevated Ishtar Astarte to the head of their pantheon. The Near Eastern influence during the archaic Greek period is well documented and attested. In the 8th century BC, Greek art was served was fairly domestic, yet less than a century later we find it awash with Near Eastern motifs and iconography. Over the course of the next few centuries, Ishtar Astarte would become adopted into the archaic Greek pantheon under the name Aphrodite, with images of the armed Aphrodite dating to this time period in relationship to her earlier uh, warlike form of Ishtar Astarte. By the classical Greek period, a transformation had taken place uh, with the armed Aphrodite, with her aspects of the goddess of sexuality and war, and the goddess with the power of over beasts separated, uh, perhaps uh, because a goddess with so many aspects, roles and genders was against the norms of society at the time. Therefore, uh, she was separated into three distinct forms, with the goddess of sexuality Aphrodite, the goddess of warfare, Athene, and the goddess with the power over beasts, Artemis, all three of her aspects, as a reflection of a more patriarchal Indo-European Greek society, as Flemberg put it. It was under the Phoenicians that Ishtar and Astarte first spread to the Mediterranean. It was from the Phoenicians that she first reached Rome, as well as Cyprus, Tangier, Sardinia, Malta, Sicily, North Africa, Spain and Portugal. At around 700 BC, 
just before the fall of the Assyrian Empire, Ishtar's worship had spread um, by the Phoenicians during the Phoenician expansion period. During this time period, and because the Phoenicians were associated with seafaring, the goddess became associated with maritime travel and activities. The Phoenician expansion began with the king of Sidon, Luli eh, of Tyre, who was sacked by the king of the Near Syrian Empire, Sennacherib. Luli was forced to flee to the Near East, or from the Near East, should I say, and he fled to Cyprus initially. And from this point in the archaeological record, we can observe the Phoenician expansion westward from Tyre to Cyprus, eh, and then from, from Cyrene to Leptis, and up, up towards Sicily, and across to Carthage, and up to Sardinia, and across to Tangier, and then across to Iberia. And from there, we can see from the material evidence that the Phoenicians reached south southern Britain. So, Ishtar and Astarte may have reached Britain under the Phoenicians. Though we say may have, for there are no Phoenician inscriptions of Astarte in Britain, but they did play a pivotal role in how the veneration of Astarte first came to Rome. And it's by the Romans that Ishtar and Astarte first reached Britain. Now, one of the major Phoenician temples to Astarte was in Sicily, and it was situated on Mount Eryx. The temple played a pivotal role in the Phoenician Empire. It first became a site of pilgrimages by the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians, eh, and the flames of the temple were said to have been used as a guiding light to mark eh, for the Phoenician fleet to navigate to and from Africa during the archaic times. In 217 BC, in the early stages of the Second Punic War between Rome and Carthage, Rome suffered a great defeat in the Battle of uh, Transmere. Um, now the Sibylian Oracle foretold that they could change, if they could change the allegiance of Astarte of Eryx, then Carthage could be defeated. This was normal practice during this time period, and it was sometimes known as god napping. Uh, this is when the, ta the statue of a deity was captured by another city or civilization. Uh, and where the deity was seen to change allegiances in favour of the new civilization, and once that happened, it was said that, that the old civilization could be defeated. And with that, Rome laid siege to Sicily and the Temple of Astarte in Eryx, and they took the Temple uh, of Astarte by force, and they stole the statue of Astarte with the promise that they would build her a majestic temple, one of the largest in Rome as a reward for her defection. And with that promise, Astarte was installed in the temple on Capitoline Hill, and she became one of the 12 major deities of Rome at that point. And they named her Venus Erycina. Rome made Venus Erycina the mother and protector of the Trojan prince Aeneas, and the ancestor of the Roman people, tying her to their Trojan past, they used her support as a goddess of warfare and kingship to support their political and military power and their hegemony. Rome later defeated Carthage and installed Astarte as their, their Venus Atrixia, um, was seen as a result of, the, um, of her favour for the new civilization being born. And this temple became associated with um, the Roman elite and it was reserved for the high status Romans. Following on from this, other Venus cults, shrines and temples were erected throughout Rome. Now, it is the Roman Empire who play a pivotal role in how Ishtar and Astarte reached Britain, though not in the way that you would imagine. Ishtar and Astarte did not move to Britain from Rome itself, nor did they move from Italy or that whole region, nor did she come here as Venus. She actually came uh, to Britannia from Syria uh, with the Roman infantry, primarily from the Syrian-born Roman soldiers, as well as professional military units of Hamian archers from Syria, known as the Cohors I Harmonium. The, Ro the Roman army's uh, archers have been estimated to be a total of uh, 20,000 men throughout um, many different provinces. It is very noteworthy that most of these 
uh, men originated in the East. And then the cohorts one harmonium was the first specialist professional auxiliary units to be recorded in the Roman service. It is well documented that they were the first cohorts of the Roman excursions into Britain, um, which included a regiment of 500 strong of these Syrian auxiliary forces, as well as other regiments of Syrian soldiers, creating over double this number. Now they came to Britain around the 1st and 2nd centuries in the Common Era. Hamian archers were one of the Romans uh, or the Roman army's specialist forces and they hailed from the city of Hama uh, in northern Syria. Now the city of Hama or Hamath means fortress. It was an ancient Amorite city dating back to the 3rd millennium BC. At around 1500 BC it became part of the Mitanni Empire but it was captured by the Hittites after the Battle of Kadesh in 1295 BC. And from the 9th century BC onwards, it became under Babylonian rule. From uh, 540 to 330 BC, Ham was part of the Persian Empire under Alexander the Great, who conquered Syria. After uh, this, it was ruled by the uh, Seleucid Empire until it fell to Rome around 64 BC. The city of Hama is still uh, there today and is the fifth largest city in Syria. And it is very noteworthy to think that Syrian people coming from Syria to a foreign land would bring their own deities with them. They wouldn't suddenly get to Britain and say, hang on a second, I'm just going to ditch all of these Syrian gods and start worship worshipping British ones, because that's not just how religion works. They would have brought all of their Syrian gods and goddesses with them, and that is what happened. But these things do not happen in a vacuum. We have a great many altars and inscriptions to New Eastern deities eh, that come to Roman Britain from Syrian soldiers. We have a great number of inscriptions to the New Eastern god Baal, who was recorded across the Roman world. In Britannia alone, we had 21 inscriptions to Baal, all spread across the length and breadth of Britannia, indicating his popularity. We also have a great uh, deal of evidence uh, of the spread from the Roman Britain for the worship and veneration of the New Eastern god Mithras, uh, which could make up a talk in its own right. At one point, Britain was awash with Near Eastern deities, as well as gods from all corners of the Western world, as was uh, the Roman way. But back to the arguments uh, from the debunking articles. Another one of the famous uh, debunking article arguments is, Eostra was originally a proto-Indo-European goddess, Hewas. I read it on Wikipedia, so it must be true. Now, even though this argument has been used for many, many years across several debunking articles, the, th the truth is that the links between the goddess Eostra and Hewas have been debunked now for well over a decade in academia. Dr. Philip A. Shaw points out that one of the biggest issues used against the existence of Eostra is the lack of evidence for Eostra being a goddess of dawn and linked to who was, despite Grimm's speculation. As early as 1959, Knobloch was using this issue to quite successfully argue against the existence of Eostra, certainly linked to who was. All current academia now points to Eostra being a goddess originally venerated in the region where Bede was based, before moving to Germanic sources and not the other way around. Perhaps Another Indo-European goddess fits better, such as Hyaster, the goddess who did have several altars located in Roman Britain under the name Astarte. Another prominent argument presented in the debunking articles as to why Ishtar cannot possibly be related to Ostra is, I don't know when Ishtar or Astarte were worshipped, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't any time around Easter, let alone tied to the vernal equinox. The problem with this argument is it is another lie. Now, the origins of the Jewish calendar and the dating of Easter are well attested. 
the Jewish calendar system is tied to the Mesopotamian calendar system. The Jewish Passover is tied to the Babylonian New Year festival of Akitu. Ishtar was venerated during the Babylonian Akitu festival, where her sacred marriage to the god Marduk took a prominent position within that festival. The Babylonian Akitu also originated from the much earlier Sumerian Akkadian agricultural festival, which was focused on the death of Anana or Ishtar, uh, Astarte's consort Demuzi Tammuz, and this took place on the vernal equinox. Anana's marriage to Demuzi was celebrated on the full moon before the vernal equinox, and the vernal equinox being the date when Demuzi died and descended to the nether world and when Anana mourned for her dead husband. This ties in with the cultic dates that we have according to the calendar of Dapur, which is what the Jewish calendar was based upon. Now during the third millennium and into the second millennium BC, Ishtar, um, his consort Demuzi, the earliest dying and resurrected god, died on the vernal equinox and at this period and then the sacred marriage festival to the Muse was celebrated on the full moon before the vernal equinox. Now, by the second millennium and during the Babylonian period, Anana's sacred marriage rite was enacted in Babylon on the first full moon after the vernal equinox. Many of her major religious festivals took place on uh, or during full moons around this period. Now, by the first millennium BC, the name of the month was changed to Nisan and the dates were fixed. So, on the 10th day of Nisan, and also on the 11th day of the month, it was when the Akitu festival of Ishtar took place. Uh, this was the date when Ishtar bestowed the mace of kingship upon the king, and this cemented his rule for the coming year. The dating of, Ish of Easter was celebrated um, on the same day as the Jewish Pass Passover, and that is on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, or on the first full moon of the first month of the year. This date was then moved by the Council of Nicaea in 325 Common Era, and it was placed on the Sunday following the first full moon. After this, Christ's death was celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. So whether Ishtar or Astarte was originally Eostra or not, the equinoxes were originally tied to both her worship and Ishtar's major religious festivals, as well as those of her consort Demuzi, which are um, captured within the earliest calendars of the ancient Near East. So really we are talking about um, the 10th and 11th of the month versus the 14th of the month. There's only like three days between them. Um, Ishtar was worshipped and her ceremonies were worshipped just three days before the date when we now count today as Easter, which I find very interesting. Another two prominent arguments presented in the debunking articles as to why Ishtar cannot possibly be related to Eostra are, after the vernal bead, the goddess Eostra isn't mentioned again until the writings of Jacob Pergrim. And the idea that Eostra was related to Ishtar was first started in the 19th century under the Scottish Protestant minister Alexander Hislop. Both of these arguments, as you've guessed it, are lies. We have three academic papers which all predate Jacob Grimm's Deutsch mythology by some hundreds or so years. The first one is the Ostera Saxonum, which states, Among the heathen nations were the names of the goddess, the most ancient of those is Astarte, Astaroth, and within them the appropriate Ostera. Astarat was worshipped by the nations throughout the world close to this time. And that comes from the, the Ostera Saxonum, which was published in 1702. And again, this um, article, or sorry, this book also quotes several earlier texts that have been lost to time. And then later, in 1731, the Zelda lexicon was published, and it states that Ostar, Eostra, or Estar 
are the same deity as those described as Osteroth or Astarte, under which the last divine known she was known orally among the Germans. And then in 1798, Bragg and Hermione too published Wald and Oster, uh, and it states that the heathens had an idol named Oster, uh, who was worshipped by the Phoenicians under the name Astartes, while the Judeans under Astaroth. Now all three of these academic papers all predate Jacob Grimm, yet no one seems to be mentioning them in any of the debunking articles. It's almost like they don't really want people to know they exist, and I find that very curious indeed. Now at this point I want to talk a little bit about the Astarte altars in Britannia. And the thing I would like people to take away from this is that there is nothing foreign about a goddess like Ishtar Astarte. It would be like using the Middle Eastern god Jesus as an argument, given how he too began his journey in the Middle East. Is Jesus a foreign deity, given he is worshipped half the world over? See, a god does not belong to a place, but to people. People who move and migrate, and in doing so, they take their gods with them on that journey. In this case, they travelled with the Syrian-born members of the Roman army. There are seven altars to the goddess Ishtar Astarte in Britain under her name, her titles and her epithets, and they are all linked to other Near Eastern gods such as Baal or Mithras, or found in temples relating to Baal or Mithras or other Near Eastern gods. The first five of these are found along Hadrian's Wall, uh, and two very, very close to where the Venerable Bede was stationed. Now, all seven altars to Astarte are listed and detailed in my book, but it is worth going into the titles and epithets included in these. These are Astarte, the primary altar we find closest to where the Venerable Bede was stationed is written as Astarte in Greek script. The Syrian goddess, the Syria. We find several altars to Astarte in the form of the goddess of Syria, which again is linked to primarily to her worship in Syria by the Hamian forces in northern Mesopotamia. And then we have the altars to the Queen of Heaven, De Calestis, and these altars are actually linked to her temple in Carthage, where she bore the title Queen of Heaven, and these are also alongside other um, temples and altars linked to uh, forces from uh, Carthage. Now the altar I want to focus on is the Astarte altar of Corchester because that is the closest to where the Venerable Bede was stationed. Now, the Venerable Bede is widely regarded as the greatest of all Anglo-Saxon scholars. He is often attributed the title the Father of English History, and his most famous work is The Ecclesiastical History of the English People, and was, first written, was the first written history of England. And he was the first to use the AD dating system, which spread from there to the wider world. It is with Venerable Bede's De Temporum Rationae, the, or the Reckoning of Time, that the goddess Eostra is first mentioned. The Reckoning of Time is Bede's uh, extensive treatise on ancient calendar systems, including the Hebrew, Egyptian, Roman and Anglo-Saxon calendar systems, as well as dating the Anglo-Saxon festivals and their origins. And on the goddess Eostra, um, the Venerable Bede writes the following. Easter month, or April, has its name, which is now translated to Passage month, which was once called after the goddess of the earth named Eostra, in whose honour feasts were celebrated in that month. Since then, there has been much debate about who Eostra actually was. Some have even speculated she may have been a form of the Proto-Indo-European dawn goddess Heosos, a hypothetical goddess who is theorised to be based on the existence of a singular language strand 
used from 4500 BCE to 2500 BCE. Heosos was reconstructed primarily based on the, gon the dawn goddess Yusas in the Rig Veda, dating to around 1500 BCE. Though how Bede would have had access to that knowledge five millennia later has not been adequately explained whatsoever. Now, the identification of Ishtar and Astarte with Yostra has subsequently been discussed and ignored, even though she is also related to an Indo-European goddess, the goddess Hastur. And we can find five altars to the Syrian goddess close to where the Venerable Bede was stationed, and these have also been ignored. The closest altar, the Astarte altar, altar of Corchester was erected around 400 years before the Venerable Bede was born and is only an hour walk from the Abbey of Hexham, a location to where Bede visited while writing his Reckoning of Time and where he is considered to be a modern saint. There it is 12 minutes between Hexham Abbey and the, old, the Astarte Oldchester of uh, Corchester as well. So let's think about this rationally. If we take it that the last inscription to Astarte in the region where Bede was based dates to around the 3rd century CE or Common Era, and that the Roman occupation of Britannia ended in the beginning of the 5th century Common Era, and that Christianity did not come into the region until the 7th century in the Common Era, we have a 200 year period before Christianity emerged in the region in which Near Eastern gods and goddesses brought under the Roman Empire were still venerated within that region. One of which, Astarte, as we have discussed, has been worshipped for over a 300 year period in Britannia, if we take her worship to the end of the Roman occupation. This is when the Hamian military forces are thought to have left our shores. And this is discounting the notion that many of them may have settled in the area or that worship of the goddesses may have inspired local cults to continue in that region. Now the Astarte altar of Corchester is made of buff sandstone and it dates to the third century common era. Today it sits in Tully House Museum. The text in the altar reads you see me, an altar of Astarte, Pulcher set me up. It has been speculated that Pulcher may have been a free provincial subject of the empire and not a Roman citizen. He may have been a provincial merchant travelling within the Roman garrison and he was likely to have been a high ranking official in the area of work, given the altar was erected to him. This altar was part of a shrine that also included an altar to, the, to Hercules of Tyre, who was identified with the Semitic god Milquart and his priestess Diodora. Both altars date to the 3rd century in the Common Era. So how does the timeline tie in with this? Well, let's have a look at the timeline just now. So around 63 Common Era, the city of Hama falls under Roman rule. Syrian forces are taken into the Roman army as specialist units of Roman auxiliaries. Then 117 to 138 Common Era, 1,000 strong Syrian forces are brought all the way from Syria to Britannia under the Emperor Hadrian. They bring their Syrian gods with them, Astarte, Baal, Hadad, Mithras, they share encampment, encampments with Germanic forces. Then it gets to 410 Common Era. The Saxons begin to migrate to Britannia. From 420 to 430 Common Era, Roman forces withdraw from Britannia. This gives a 300 year period when Syrian gods were venerated across Northumbria. And this is assuming that many Syrians or their kin did not settle in the area after the Romans left. So at this point, Germanic forces also leave Britain, uh, taking with them Near Eastern gods back to the Lower Rhine area, most significantly Hercules of Tyre, who shared the same temple in Britain as Astarte. Then for 445 Common Era, Britannia comes under Anglo-Saxon rule, 
though this did not mean the entire population was replaced by Saxons. While in southern England there is evidence of a much greater number of Saxon settlers, Northumbria still housed a significant number of Britons, and this was not greatly affected uh, um, as in northern kingdoms at this period. And it stated that it is widely accepted that the north of England, the native population survived to a greater extent than the south, and that a small group of immigrants may have replaced the native British elite that took over the kingdom as a growing concern. Native beliefs, including the veneration of local goddesses of the area, may have continued. Then, at 619, Paulus arrives in York and Christianity begins to uh, be initiated in Northumbria over the next 40 years. At 427 Common Era, Christianity intensifies when King Edwin was baptised, and then 664 Common Era, the Council of Whitby, uh, was when the calculation of Easter got its Roman makeover, and then 673 Common Era is when the Venerable Bede was born. So the question we must ask at this juncture is, one, did the Venerable Bede, a historian of some repute, know about this local altar, located only a 20 minute horse ride from Hexham Abbey and dating four centuries earlier? Or, two, is it more plausible that Bede somehow had this advanced knowledge of a proto-Indo-European dawn goddess named Heosus, dating five millennia earlier, and originating at the Pontic Caspian steppe of eastern Ukraine and southern Russia? I will leave that question for you to answer, my dear listeners. Now, one thing that bothers me is um, the question of whether the Venerable Bede knew exactly who Astarte was or how popular her worship was. Now, that is an entirely different matter as Bede would have had access to church records which spoke of her at every location. Her temple in Roman Carthage continued unabated well into Christian times, and we have very early Christian bishops and priests writing from all over the empire about the size and influence of her cult. Augustine speaks of vast assemblages of people who took part in her liturgy, even into the Christian period, as a shrine to the goddess was placed that the people could turn to in times of need. Cyprian, the Archbishop of Carthage from 200 to 258 uh, Common Era, refers to the story when her idol was taken out of the temple to where the people flocked, and it's in, in its presence they gave a small child bread and wine. We also have records of her temple by Augustine, uh, Bishop of Hippo, from 354 to uh, 430 Common Era, who uh, taught at one time in Carthage. And he notes as a younger man, he actually participated in her religious services in Carthage. And he mentions that vast crowds of people were still coming to her temple from every quarter of the city, even far into the Christian period. And again, Salvian, from 400 to 480 Common Era, Christian clergymen uh, referred to the, uh, in his writings the difficulties of the situation, and he noted that even the Christians uh, in the city went to her services both before uh, and after their own Christian worship. Uh, and this no doubt led to the downfall of the last temple of Astarte in Europe. Now, her temple came to an end in the 5th century in the Common Era, when it was taken over by force by the Christian Church, amid, lo amid loud pro protests from the pagans of the time, and Christians uh, began demanding of its destruction. So, uh, in 401 Common Era, uh, a general council was called under uh, uh, the bishop at the time, Aurelius, uh, and the assembly of the Church Fathers called for pagan sanctuaries to be destroyed. So in 421, under the, the Imperial Tribune, a, the magnificent temple to Astarte was finally demolished. And the site was turned into a Christian cemetery and all idols and artifacts were destroyed, despite the 
Pagan demands that the artefacts be returned to them, as was recorded in church records. And this was the last temple to Astarte in Europe. Conclusions It is not the aim of this talk to prove that the Anglo-Saxon goddess Eostra was a diffusion of the goddess Ishtar or Astarte. Academia does not work in that way. No one in academia deals in absolutes and nothing is completely debunked. Not when we have evidence being unearthed each passing decade, which allows us to glean new understandings and helps us to re-evaluate our evidence and posit new theories. Anyone who says anything is debunked it has no understanding of how the world works. The main aim of this talk is to instead provide a working model to show there is more to this picture than many people are letting on. But when we look at the evidence from the etymological evidence through to the spread of uh, the worship of the goddess Ishtar Astarte across the length and breadth of the ancient Near East, down the Levantine Corridor and into Egypt, across North Africa and across the Mediterranean into ancient Greece and Rome and across Europe, even into the British Isles, where we have seven altars to the Syrian goddess dedicated here. One of which, the Ishtar Astarte altar of Corchester, is only a, tw a 20 minute horse ride from where the Venerable Bede was stationed while he wrote Reckoning of Time. And then we have the three earlier Germanic textual academic sources, all of which predate Jacob's Grimm and all of which identify Eustra's origins of Ishtar and Astarte. And then we can look at the Roman emperors um, who elevated Ishtar and Astarte throughout their reigns and during the Roman occupation of Britannia. And then again, we can look at the Serene born archers who came all the way from Syria and were stationed along Hadrian's Wall during the same time period when we had uh, Germanic military auxiliaries from the Lower Rhine area of Germany. Uh, and again, those German uh, military auxiliaries took Near Eastern gods back with them to Germany, namely uh, the god Hercules, uh, who again shared uh, a shrine with Ishtar and Astarte in Corchester. So the, there is a great deal of evidence of religious congruence. It is very, very clear. So over the past decade, it seems that we have been told a string of lies, falsehoods and misrepresentations across countless debunking articles, online lectures and across online discussion forums, which have inevitably been captured by Wikipedia and sold to us as unquestionable truth. Perhaps it is now time to start questioning them. And we must remember that Wikipedia is not an academic source. An academic source is academia. So these are a few conclusions based on the debunking articles. Eostra was worshipped in a very different geographical location to Ishtar and Astarte. This is false. Eostra was worshipped in a very different time period to Ishtar and Astarte. Also false. Eostra is an Anglo-Saxon goddess of dawn. False. This has been debunked in academia. Eostra is an entomological deviation of the pie goddess Hewas. Also false. This has been debunked for a decade in academia. Ishtar and Astarte was never worshipped in Britain. False. There are seven altars here dedicated to her. Eostra's relation to Ishtar was first suggested by the 19th century Christian minister Alexander Hislop. False. We have three Germanic academic papers that all predate this by quite some time. I don't know when Ishtar and Astarte was worshipped, but it's definitely not tied to the vernal equinox. Also false. Most of Ishtar and Astarte's uh, religious festivals are all tied to the vernal equinox or the autumnal equinox. The vernal Obed would have had known nothing about the goddess Ishtar or Astarte. This is also false. 
There are plenty of church records which mention her in depth, eh, even a few hundred years before the Venerable Bede was born, and we also have the altar, only 12 minutes horse ride from where he was stationed. There are no German academic publications that link Eustra to Ishtar and Astarte. Also false, there are three academic papers, all of which predate Jacob Grimm. The Venerable Bede may, probably made the whole thing up. False. To, to suggest someone um, is as high, highly thought of as the Venerable Bede would make something like that up is just nonsense. Ishtar is probably pronounced Hishtar and sounds nothing like Easter. Also false. The Venerable Bede probably knew about a pie goddess, he was. This is also false. I am not sure how you could justify the Venerable Bede having any advanced knowledge of something that took place 5,000 years earlier compared to an altar that only predates him by a few hundred years. After the Venerable Bede, the first time Eostra is mentioned in academia is by Jacob Grimm. Again, false. We have three German uh, academic papers that all predate Jacob Grimm by quite some time. Easter is named after Eostra. Very likely. Eustra is the, an etymological uh, deviation of Ishtar and Astarte. Actually, this is possible. Some final thoughts, um, some academic additions since publication. An expert on phonetics got in touch after reading my article in the book uh, and was discussing um, the, the possibility of the passage from Astarte to Eustra. And his thoughts were, and I'll read it uh, from what he said, looking at your proposal, here are a few thoughts. What happened to the second T in Astarte? Surely it would have remained in the cluster of RT, though evidentially produced a P um, when borrowed from the Anglo-Saxon, but of course the final syllable E would have been dropped. And uh, the final long E, the Latinized form of the name, should have probably been a long I. The British vulgar Latin, which would have been the I in inflection of the second A before the final syllable was dropped, we would get something like Yestrab um, if there is no inflection, or you would get something like Easter. So it seems a start it does give us Easter after all. So I'd like to finish with another overview of the map showing how. Uh, Ishtar and Astarte moved from the Near East across um, the Western world under the Phoenicians from 900 BC uh, to 333 BC, and then under the Roman Empire from 121 common area to 132 common era under Emperor Hadrian. And there Astarte was venerated until um, the third century uh, in the common era under the Hamian archers and the Syrian uh, forces that came all the way from Syria uh, under the Roman occupation of Britannia at that time. Thank you for listening and please buy my book. It's available in hardback, paperback and an Amazon Kindle and it's currently sitting at four stars out of five on Amazon. And some of the reviews are very, very good. In fact, some of the reviews I'm, I've had from very prominent heathens have also been very surprising and very good. I'd like to read a few of them just now. First one, it says, I think it's a triumph. I hope people will become more open and look at the evidence, not just looking at Wikipedia, which could be edited by people with an axe to grind or doing a battle of uh, joker memes. And this one here, uh, the second one is by a very prominent heathen uh, and one of the leaders of uh, one of the largest heathen groups in Britannia or Britain. Uh, and it says, I thought there were only parts of interest for me, so I was going to skim through the good bits. I ended up reading the whole thing in one day. I can't remember the last time I did that. Excellent book. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'll be looking at some of it, I'll be looking at some of it again. Well done. Uh, I was particularly pleased with that, this uh, second review because, as I said, it's, it's from the leader of one of the largest um, heathen organisations of Britain. And while you're still 
tuning in. Uh, I would also like to announce that Iana Press are delighted to announce that we have opened submissions for our first in an anthology, an anthology of literature, artwork, and devotional work, prayers, hymns, retold myths, and rituals all dedicated to the goddess Inanna. Please send your submissions through. Thank you. Thank you for listening.